so welcome to the stream. Um, if you just joined us, um, today I'm going to be talking a little bit about mixing theory. And, like, basically when you go to mix, and or even from the ground up, going from sound design to putting your ideas down to mixing, a lot of people, you know, get a little bit overwhelmed, I guess. And, yeah, I thought it would be helpful to, like, sort of go through my thought process when I'm mixing and sound designing. And, um, yeah. So I think to do that, I'm actually going to have to show you some images first. It's, I'm going to have try and um, explain it using art theory. Now, there's loads of videos online about painting theory and you know, how to make beautiful paintings, but there's not really a lot about, you know, getting real intricate and beautiful mixes and sounds. Yeah, let's start by talking about um, art theory. So I'm gonna pull up an image that I found on ArtStation and just talk a little bit about why I think it's a good looking image. Let's start with depth, okay? The things in the background are way more faint and have le way less detail than all the things in the foreground. And that's one of the ways this artist has created depth in this painting. So he's using um, less color variation as well in the background, as you can see. In the, in the, in the foreground, he's using loads of different colors and shapes and yeah the background is a little bit more uniform to this sort of pattern and that's something i think about a lot when i'm going to mix a track about you know how can i create depth and variation and make it seem like things are popping out at you so i guess the best place to start is with atmospheric depth and also how all these shapes are sort of overlapped to uh, portray depth. You know, you can tell this is in the foreground because it's in front of this thing. So let's uh, pull out a little example. So this is a little loop I made a long time ago, and I just took off all the plugins, and we're going to mix it from scratch. So it's just this two eight bars. You know, I have a little... Uh, sort of melodic intro thing and then sort of drop idea. And we're going to try and like shape this into something that sounds more complete. So I'll just so that. So there's that loop and then there's this. So yeah, as you can hear, it's all pretty f unmixed and everything's sort of cluttered and yeah, that's because I took all the plugins off and started again com from scratch. So to start, we're going to sort of create separation in the most basic way by like having things not play while other things are playing. So the most typical thing you do normally is uh, side chaining the drums to or or any el element it c that's the great thing about music is it's so subjective that you know whatever element you want to stick out is what you do this to but right now i want the kick and the snare to i want them to be like you know the things that pop out most in this mix so i'm what I've already done, as you can see, is I've created these little trigger MIDI channels, which are being sent to Volume Shaper on this group, which I've turned off, and this group, which it has all the bass, all the melodic stuff, all the effects, and this group has all the like percussive stuff. So the first thing I'm going to do to mix this track 
because add that in. So I'm just going to turn these on. If I open these up, you can see this is for the kick on the percussion the percussion channel, and it's got a really just you know because the percussion channel is mainly high end stuff. And there, because there's not much low end stuff that I want to keep, I just want the percuss the percussive stuff to cut out while um, the sort of high end of the kick is playing, which is a very short attack. So I only needed a, a very short um, attack time for this volume shaper that's being um, triggered by the kick. And this is the snare. Now, because the snare has more high-end information, I wanted it to put it in front of all the percussive stuff a little bit more because the, because they were going to clash more. So I added a little bit of a slower attack together with all the kick and snare. Let's turn off this. Whereas before, you can hear it's, it's, it's clashing and, and the snare isn't given its chance to shine and neither is help, and the kick is sort of buried. So let's pull up this image again. So what I'm doing now is I'm just putting shapes behind shapes. So you know, whereas before you could probably see th through this, I'm now just coloring this in. I'm making a shape opaque in front of another shape. Whereas before everything was playing at the same time, you could hear everything, everything was transparent. So that's just a way, way to give solidity to whatever I want to put as the focal point for this. Okay. Um, and I'm going to apply that same principle within the drums themselves. So right now, I have these two samples which provide the snare sound. Let me just group that. I've got these two. And they're both playing at the same time. They both have a sharp transient. And, okay, so I have to decide now like, do I want all this to be playing at the same time, or do I want to create a little bit of separation within the sound itself? Um, and I think I want to create a little bit of separation. I want to leave this to take care of the transient part of the sound. And I want to just add a little high end with this. So I'm going to take the transient out. I'm going to add a little fade, like maybe there. Whereas before it was like, you can hear it's sort of a little bit too, I don't know, sharp. When I allow one sound to come in a little bit later, it's a little bit smoother, you know, things are a little bit more controlled. So I'm going to do that for the rest of these. So th that's the first thing we're doing. We're not even going into EQing or anything. We're just talking about having sounds cut out when other sounds are playing. And then again with this stuff. So right now. It's just all playing at the same time, it's all messy. Let's turn on these volume shapers. One is triggering the kick, the other is triggered by the snare. So I have it these shapes, I've split it into two bands here, you can see. The lower band has a way slower attack, or more drastic, and then the high band has less because there's more low end in the kick information than the high end. 
And for the snare, kind of did the opposite because with the snare you have a very, at least in drum and bass, you have a very short fundamental and then most of the information is going to be coming from the harmonics. So I've added a fast, uh, a slow attack to the harmonics and a fast attack to the uh, lower band. So when I turn those on. <laughs> There, that al has allowed now for the drums to come through because there's nothing playing behind it anymore. It's now, a s whenever the kick's playing, it's at zero. And whenever the snare's playing, it's at zero. And same for the percussion. So the only thing you hear is that transient of the kick and the snare at that point throughout the whole mix. Already it's sounding way better than this. The first thing I always do, it's literally the same as, you know, erasing messy edges when you're drawing. So. Okay. So the next thing I wanted to talk about is the compression and um, how to place things in the mix. Which things do you want to be in the background and which things do you want to be in the foreground? Let's bring up another image. I, I selected a few. So again, in this painting, um, you can see that the things in the background, there's less color dynamics or less uh, um, value dynamics, meaning that the darkest values and the lightest values are closer together in the background than they are in the foreground. In the foreground, you see there's areas of real dark, you know, darker than the rest of the painting, and then the lightest areas. There's a lot of contrast in the foreground elements. So how do you create contrast like that in mixing. And when we're talking about um, value dynamics, we can apply that to gain dynamics. So when something it is more forward in the mix, there's more dynamics in gain. And when something is less uh, forward in the mix, when it's further away, it's more squashed. There's less um, uh, gain dynamics. Because even in air, it does the same thing to light as it does to sound. It compresses the sound. The further away a sound wave is, by the time it reaches your ears, it's gone through all this air, it's compressed. So what you want to do to create depth in the mix, a lot of people just think, OK, if I want to push something back in the mix, I'll just make it quieter. But that's not really um, achieving the goal what you really want to do is make it sound like it's from further away. So let's go to this intro thing. Now, right now, unmixed, the closest thing to my ears sounds like this. And I recorded this all myself, by the way, because um, I wanted, well, I didn't plan on using this for the stream, but I, I, I use this because it has a lot of acoustic uh, recording in it. Okay, so the first thing I want to do is put this back in the mix and then bring another element forward. So. First thing I'll do, um, well, get rid of all this. Um, I'm going to compress it. I think I'll use a glue compressor for this. And you can use any compressor for this. You can use multiband compression for this. Multiband compression actually does a, a better job at recreating what it sounds like further away. But right now, we're just going to use normal compression just to illustrate a point.
Okay, so instead of just lowering the volume, what I did is I just lowered the threshold and the compression, meaning um, there's less dynamics between the lowest and the highest, highest peaks. So already it just sounds further back instead of just doing this. See, then it, it sounds quieter, but it doesn't sound further away. You're not moving along the z-axis. It just brings down the... It's like desaturating, almost, <laughs> instead of um, pushing it back. So we're... Okay, so this is now pushed back in the middle. Now I want to decide what I want to bring forward in the mix. So I think for this, I want this little vocal thing which I made in Vocaloid. To be one of the main sort of focal points of this section. So there's many ways you can go about this, but Whatever you're doing, you have to think about creating more dynamics because you want this to be closer, just like in the paintings. So one way that you can do that is with saturation. Let's put a sat whoop, saturate on this. And what that does is add harmonics and make it brighter. But we also want to make it darker, meaning we want more variation or more dynamics between the like, lowest peaks and highest peaks of that sound. So um, one way that we can do that is splitting the, bat splitting the sound in two using a multi-band effects unit such as this and then processing different parts of the sound differently. So we have low end, and we want to make it rounder and, and, and darker, so we maybe add a little bit of distortion to the low end, so a little bit of saturation. <laughs> To create that contrast between the dark and light, we're going to do the opposite to the harmonics. So we're going to compress the harmonics. There's many ways you can use compression, and this is just one of the ways. But we're having less dynamics in the, in the high end, and then more dynamics in the low end, which creates that feeling of it being more close to you. And to make it sound bigger, well, every sound interacts with this environment. And let's say let's we want to create a space for the sound. And we can do this to the background elements as well. We add a little bit of reverb, maybe. Let's add some reverb. Group that. Now what I've done here is I've created a chain for the reverb and then a dry chain which we'll, we won't put anything on. So we're just going to work on the reverb because you could just put the reverb on and, you know, it would sound fine. But uh, 
to illustrate the point of what I'm trying to talk about, I'm going to se separate these and compress the reverb and EQ the reverb separately because we want the reverb to be part of the background and we want the main sound to be the focal point. So we're going to squash the reverb to push it back, just like we did with the other guitar part. And that's just another way of creating separation. So this vocal that's saying further is now getting closer. <laughs> so anyway. So we've brought this forward and we pushed this thing back. Another way to push things back is to limit the width. I mean, we still want to hear it in the mix. other guitar. Which we can then decide, you know, how forward or backward we want to push these in the mix as well. And then of course you can place things left and right. Here I've done a little bit of panning to each guitar part just to give it a bit of a width. But yeah, right now we're just using compression. No EQing or anything. I've decided I want all these guitar parts in the background to sort of blend into one, and then this vocal will be more up front. Okay, now we're going to apply that same principle here. we're going to change it around because I don't want this vocal to be up front anymore. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to duplicate this. Get rid of all these. Drag this down. Okay, so now it's we have a blank slate to work from. We can get rid of all this. And we can push these back cuz I don't want these to be forward in the mix in this section. Still want to be able to hear them. So now I have to decide what I want to be the main focal point of this sound, bring it out as much as possible. I don't know if I want that. Okay, I think this is going to be a fair candidate. So we're just going to use simple simple techniques to get the result.
and then I'm gonna let me think of another way um, besides that to get more dynamics and sound. Um, one way. Um, let's use. Uh, Now there's multiband compression, but there's also multiband expansion. So we can use a combination of those two things to sort of get that um, more dynamics out of the sound, more variation. So right now, so this is in compressed mode. But if I set it to expand mode. So now you hear like the low mids sort of popping out a little bit more. And I'm going to apply the exact opposite to the high end. more squashed and now it has a little bit more dynamics and pop. Okay, and let's think of another way to make it pop out a little bit more and have more dynamics. Um, maybe using a transient shaper. Making the highest peaks pop out a little bit more. Quietest parts are even more quieter because I've lowered the sustain. And now let's add a little bit of reverb again and push it more in the background so again you have more of that separation. Actually, not reverb. Let's add delay and do it that way. Let's make it seem like there's a bit of an echo and it's in the background. Let's use filter delay just because I never use this anymore. Let's put this here. this back we're going to use multiband dynamics so we're going to use the same principle another thing is generally when i'm working trying to push things back with compression i have very short attacks and release settings um, the way that air compresses sound i mean all you have to do is set up a mic at the far end of a room somewhere and record stuff and then compare it to something that you recorded with it right next to you. You can hear already what that is doing. It's almost, yeah, like OTT. Bring up the sound and everything's squashed.
this, we can push in the, into the background. We can even apply the same principles to the, some of these percussion elements. Yeah, so I'm thinking this and this will be more upfront and all these things I right, add a little bit of EQ to these I forgot yeah we're just gonna leave these EQs in because all they're doing is taking out low end um, yeah I'm gonna compress these three and leave these three more uncompressed that's my plan See if that goes well. how far back I want to push those things and maybe I want to bring it forward a little bit. All I'm thinking about right now is the Z axis. You have X, Y, and Z. And I'm just thinking about pushing things forward and backwards. Okay, um, another thing that I want to be now I want to decide what parts of it's the bass sound so obviously for drum and bass bass and drums are the most important thing so this has to be a focal point in some way but the thing is with all this stuff going on in the middle the middle frequencies we don't have much room to play with so we can create this sound design let's see what i did here if I take all this off. So what I did is I'm trying to create more harmonics because I needed 
something to make this bass sound pop out a little bit more, meaning be pushed forward along the Z axis. So I did all these things to give it a little bit more harmonics. And also I tried to mess up the mids a bit because um, I didn't want them to clash as much. And this is without any e real EQing. There's a little bit to take out the very low sub of this. But otherwise, there's no EQing on this. But um, the way I'm, I'd usually do this is I'd try to bring out those harmonics a little bit more. So to add interest to this high-end information, because we want it to pop out more, meaning we also want it to move more and, and catch the ear more. So I'm just going to add a little comb filter with a little bit of movement, just to catch the ear. Maybe sync it to, so it's in tempo. crowded but you can hear that bass a little bit better and I've just decided I want some of these other guitar parts being pushed back this one still way I can hear it way too much and I want it to be further back in the park some reverb with this. set back in the mix. And I also um, narrowed the stereo width as well a little bit um, just to make it sound like it's further away because usually when a sound is coming from far away it's coming uh, it's coming from a, s a smaller point. Your ears don't hear as much of a difference between left and right when it's coming from further away unless the sound unless it's coming from some huge sound source that's like miles wide, you're not gonna um, experience that phenomenon. Yeah, narrowing the band a little bit sets it back a little bit. So just to recap, we're just sort of saturating and making the sounds that we want to be more forward in the mix, have more dynamics and more, uh, you know, difference between the dark and light parts of the sound and then in the background we're just compressing it to make it squashed a little bit so it sounds further away because that's what air does now let's get into EQing with EQ we're essentially doing the same thing as we're doing with compression but um, you know and and also um, you know, how we made space for other elements using side chaining and, you know, adding uh, timing differences and stuff. EQ is sort of a combination of that. So now we have to decide what information we want to keep and what information we don't need to keep and what elements do we want to be the main focal point and what do we not. So 
the main focal point in this sound, in this part of the song. Analyze the sound quickly. Um, Most of the information in the sound is coming from this area in the spectrum, which is like, you know, 200 to about 600 hertz. So when we're EQing, all we're doing is kind of making room for that uh, part of the spectrum so that um, that sound sticks out more opposed to the others. So let's go through all these sounds. little harp there. Um, yeah, I, I forgot to compress that and stuff, so we'll leave that for now. Um, let's just look at this sound. Okay, so this also has a lot of information in that range from 200 to, you know, whatever. So naturally, first inclination I do is to take that up. You know, you could even just take it out completely from below that. But I'm not going to do that because I think it sounds way too thin. You know, I want it to sound like a real guitar coming from far away, so I'm not going to just completely high pass it because that's very unnatural. Now let's look at the sound. This also has a lot of information in that same frequency range, but let's see what happens. So now I almost think that there's too much separation between the, fo the foreground and the background. Right now you have the foreground that's super up in your face and then the background that's far away. But that's also unnatural because if you're hearing musicians perform on a stage, you'll you know hear one person a little bit closer and the rest will be a little bit further away, but there's not going to be this huge distance between them. So let's tone back this vocal a little bit. <laughs> So now it's a little bit closer together. We have one more guitar sound. So this sound, what we don't want to do is take away too much of this low end information because you can hear there's stuff below that 200 hertz range that that vocal um, is, where that vocal is, and I want that because that's kind of creating like a bass line to the section. Sound 
more careful because we don't really want it to be as much of a background element. It's like supplying a lot of the structure to that sound. <laughs> This sound I want to be kind of more up front. So I'm just going to do the multi pass thing. Yeah. Don't want to um, distort or saturate the lowest band too much because, yeah, we don't want too much low end information in this sound. It's a harp, it's not a bass. my choices of where I'm placing things but you can choose wherever you want to place these things you can ch change it around you can you know play around with it basically um, but you know using this keeping in mind how you push things forward and backwards in a mix and how you create that contrast and um, things that are more forward and you squash things that are further back it's really simple techniques that will help you <laughs> high mids because I feel like it's clashing with all these guitars that are going on so I'm sort of making room for all this stuff because here I really just want that which is a very you know th it's there are some like harmonics in it but mainly the the meat of that sound is all here in the same range as the vocal but it's not bothering me as much because there's nothing else really clashing with it except for that and it's just one little part of this it's like <clears throat> one moment rather than it just a part that's being played throughout the whole section <laughs> so again it's not bothering me that it's clashing with that vocal as much because they're sort of two focal points that it, the ear can pick up on. The ear, just like the eye, needs focal points to listen to or else it just sounds like a big mess. But if you cut away and, you know, have one or two focal points, then the ear has something to latch onto <clears throat> and you're all right. Okay, so let's do the same thing to this section. <laughs> still sounding pretty messy and EQing is going to help that a lot. We haven't even processed the kick and snare at all, by the way, keep in mind. So let's just start from the top. To, um, I'm not going to do any EQing to the percussion stuff because I already did a little bit, just taking out low end here and there. So right now let's focus on these guitars because I feel like that's the most messy part of this mix. Already, I can hear. I want to take out all that low end. I don't care about it sounding natural for this section because it's, you know, drum and, the drum and bass drop section. So it doesn't need to sound as natural and acoustic. I just want this to be a subtle indication in the background. I don't want to hear too much low end, and I just don't, you know, just a little subtle light somewhere off in the distance. Maybe even add a little reverb slash delay. And when I and when something's in the background, I usually don't 
uh, process the e the delay or reverb separately because it's in the background. It's you know, it's all together in the same space far away. Stereo width so it doesn't get too wide. talk about is um, the difference between like hard and soft edges in paintings. Here, here's a good example. So in this sort of sketch, we see, um, you know, some hard edges like here and here, you know, where there's like very hard lines and then there's soft ones like here and here. And that's how it creates interest for the eye, like here in the background, there's soft edges and hard edges and variation. <coughs> and the way you do that in mixing is, yeah, adding reverb to some sounds, that maybe adding a little bit of pre reverb, like, you know, bouncing the or flattening a reverb tail and then putting it before the sound. You know, having things flow into each other, not always having things. Um, with sharp edges and then having things, you know, blur out with, with delay and reverb. And then you have some things that are completely dry and that creates the hard versus soft edges. start EQing out things because I don't know which part I want to um, be I mean we know which part we want to be the focal point but we haven't really made it the focal point with any EQing yet so let's do that first let's add an EQ to this What is the meat of the sound? What is the sound that we want, to, the part of the sound that we want to stick out in the mix? To me, it's like that. Yeah, to me, it's like around there. And it's kind of dangerous boosting things around there because the ear, the human ear, does not like frequencies around here. When it gets louder, usually. Um, I can show you this thing. Uh, what's this curve called? Somebody in the chat tell me. Something Munson. <laughs> Fletcher Munson. That's the one. Okay, so this is the curve of the human hearing. So when think this is a, you know, the decibels. Yeah, decibels, and this is the frequency. So the louder something is, the human ear perceives it in a different way. So the louder something is, our human ears are tend to make a dip around this this frequency because now there's many theories about that, but I've read us because that's like the frequency of a baby's scream. <laughs> um, so I don't know. Our our brains don't like that 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 frequency. Whenever you're boosting around there, it's kind of good to make sure you're not boosting too much around 4 to 5k. Yeah, if I can boost that, you'll hear not a very pleasant frequency boost. sound is obviously that bass.
Yeah, and it feels like the meat to me of this sound is the fundamental. Which is the subharmonic. Yeah, it doesn't really need that part of the sound to to make its point. But then we might have cl clashing with our other um, focal point, which is that guitar part. Slightly lowering DBBs in that section. up a few db yeah so we're finding the parts of the space sound that we want to bring out and the parts that we don't because it clashes with our other main focal point Think that part of the sound is kind of sticking out a little bit too much. Still on the dynamics in that we created with this Pro MB because I still want it to be the focal point, but I'm just going to take it down a little bit. These little su subtle shifts and variations that you know make your mix come alive. compatibility because when I'm checking mono compatibility I'm checking that when I put it into mono are my focal points still my focal points or are they lost all of a sudden that's a good start because it sounds you know like the guitar and the bass are still the focal points when I put it into mono so that's always a really good way to check if you're go if you're on the right track um, you know, a lot of artists reference their um, their images in black and white, and that's kind of <laughs> similar to what I'm doing when I'm referencing in mono. I'm just checking for values in color, I mean, in sound color, and putting into mono is very revealing just to make, make you realize which part of uh, your mix is sticking out more, and if it doesn't change when, you're, when you switch it back to um, stereo, then I just have this mid side plugin up um, hot um, hot keyed to these two things on my so if I press uh, side it meets the um, mids and if I press mids it meets the side so I can just hear each one individually. You can hear that it's made a huge improvement just using compression and EQing. Because 
that's all you really need to mix. Now, of course, you can do so much more. You know, you can have the focal points change over time. You can, you know, make yeah, make it so something become is is up front at first, and then g gradually fades into the background, and something from the background comes and becomes up front. You can do so many things because, unlike painting, you have time to play with. You're not just um, capturing. It's like more like animation than drawing. Um, so you're taking in all these all these uh, concepts and applying it over time, which is where you get into the real creative side of electronic music and sound design. Um, yeah, and again, when you're sound designing, you can take all this macro information and condense it into the, these individual sounds. Because, if, you know, when you want a, uh, one sound to have depth, it's the same principles you're working with. You're squashing some things and pushing them to the back and then bringing other things forward in, within the one sound. These techniques will help you when it comes to mixing because a lot of people just go to mixing and they think, oh, I don't know what I'm doing, I'll just do, so do stuff until it sounds good. And whereas that does work, like eventually you will get a sound by tweaking and just, you know, and that's, a gr and that's the best way to learn, to be honest. But when you have a theory, when you have uh, um, a way you know that um, is going to work because it's based on you know, science and the way the human brain works, you're going to have an easier time when getting started, at least. You know, you'll, st you'll still run into issues and problems, but those problems will be a lot less difficult to overcome when you have your own theory. And my theories are all to do with visual art. You can come up with your own theories related to, I don't know, cooking or um, God knows what, you know, Minecraft <laughs> or, yeah, or any other game or, it's just, f having your own theory is important. Having your own, like, method. You can hear the producers that have their own sort of method and ethos to producing and um yeah just find your own basically um I, yeah the visual art analogy for me is perfect because there's so much information online about visual art theory you know colored harmonies and um you know how to get better shapes and better uh and how to make realistic lighting it's all way more relevant than i've found anywhere else because just replace light with sound and you're using exactly the same techniques so um, yeah I hope this helped okay so saturation yeah it does reduce the dynamic range sometime with the extreme settings like when you just when you're distorting the hell out of something it yeah it it can um, reduce the dynamic range but essentially saturation is just supposed to be adding harmonics, adding more peaks um, in the high end, and I'll just demonstrate that with a sine wave. Okay, so let's just bring out Pro Q. This is a sine wave, unsaturated, and all the saturation does is <laughs> add harmonics. Now, <clears throat> it does create the effect of uh, reduction in um, gain dynamics, but when So makes your sound fuller and so yes um, in certain settings saturation brings things forward in the mix and also the different types of saturation you know using an analog piece of gear to saturate your sound is going to bring things way more forward in the mix than using digital um, because it does keep that dynamic in the in dynamics and peaks when more I feel like when you use certain analog circuits Right now, I'm just using digital to prove a point, but um, yeah. 
saturation does uh, limit the dynamic range sometimes. So you have to be careful. So when I'm processing a sound by mixing the lows, mids, highs separately, um, to make it sound cohesive, um, well, obviously I'm using like, you know, all these things I talked about, uh, just compression, reverb, and uh, EQs, but also thinking about overlap and having things flow into each other as well. Um, and sometimes you don't want things to sound like one cohesive sound. And sometimes when things aren't one cohesive sound, they sound more like one cohesive sound. Like I, so when I uh, compress the reverb more and set it more in the background, even though it's sort of separating it from the main sound, it makes it sound like one cohesive sound more because it's more natural, if that, if that makes sense. Yes, my mixing uh, definitely varies depending on genres. For instance, you know, the elements that stick out, that are meant to stick out in genre and bass are completely different from the elements that are meant to stick out in, say, house. And it's all to do with taste, really. Um, but, you know, for me, I like house or trance tunes with, you know, more body in the lows and the drums, like more beef in the kick and the clap and snare, whatever, is, you know, way more subdued. Whereas drum and bass is like the opposite. The kick is way less important and the snare is basically the most important part. So yeah, for every different genre, there's a different um, thinking that I go through. And that just, you know, over time you develop your own taste, so. Question, how often would you say you use less conventional mixing methods, i.e. chorus and phaser flanger effects? Um, I don't know, to me they're conventional mixing methods. Like people have been using chorus and flange and phasing on tracks since, well, since like the 70s. <laughs> And yeah, they used to put like a, a flanger on the master sometimes. And um, yeah, it's just little weird things. Uh, but I do use them often. Usually when I use a flanger or a phaser or something like that, it's because I want it to move more. I want it to catch the ear. Like I put that comb filter on the high end and add a little LFO on that bass sound just to give it a little bit of movement to catch the ear. That's what I like to use flanger and phasing and stuff like that for. So I do use it a lot. And to me, less conventional for right now is using really conventional methods of, of recording. And like for the last year or so, I've gotten really obsessed with just going back and learning the basics. Like, I mean, everything aside from actually cutting to tape, <laughs> I've like, you know, gone into analog synths and analog gear somewhat. I've got a few outboard units and just trying to use my instruments more because I am a musician first and then I became a producer and I just kind of stopped playing music and I just wanted to get back into it. So right now for me, unconventional is conventional, you know, recording with mics and trying to play around with mic placements and yeah. and. Get, getting such good results out of it because obviously it's way easier getting a natural sound out of something natural than trying to synthesize it from scratch, which was kind of what I used to do. Well, with kick sub relationship, especially in house, um, a lot of it is to do with, um, well, first of all, having a good kick sound is important, but also having the kick be roughly in tune or at least in uh, a good harmonic relationship to the bass. So when I say good harmonic relationship, it could mean that the kick is like a fifth up from the bass sound or a seventh or um, something that creates a nice even uh, distribution between those two frequencies. Otherwise, if it, they're at like odd frequencies, then it you'll, you'll hear it sounds weird. And then, but if there's a bass line that's constantly changing, throughout the song then yeah you have to take that into account as well and uh, I can I think I've done streams before about kick design but I don't know if I recorded them essentially with kick design I can just make a kick quickly right now S simple for house and trance this is pretty 
standard to what I do. So let's just use the kick to standard kick sound that it comes, that, that loads when you open it up. Let's just make something out of this. So it showed the principle of making a kick. So what I'm doing is I'm shortening the end of this because I'm going to add another um, sound to this kick. So we're just doing the transient. Let's put it over here. Maybe play with the pitch a little bit. Okay, and then what I do is I add the sub in afterwards. Maybe even shorten this a bit. And like how I layered that s the snare before, where I like added a little bit of fade to one layer, that's what I'm going to do here. Is I'm going to, um, I'll just use an envelope. So. So there's the. sub for that one kick sound and it's just a question of fine fine tuning it so they're they sort of phase nicely into each other and usually that involves some sort of pitch envelope on the Also, like seeing if it sounds better over here or sounds better over here. Um, yeah, trying to get the phase relationship right. And essentially, phase good phase relationship will look like you know when you see something phasing, you'll see it in the waveform when you go to freeze it. So it'll look sort of like th this, and then there'll be a little dip, and then it will get quieter again like that. And a good phase, phase it will, you know, phase out nicely like that. Anyway, so it's just getting a nice phase. And usually this will take me like half an hour, an hour sometimes just to get this right. And then I'll tweak it as I go along um, when I'm making the track. And the reason why I don't like to have the sub um, just in this plugin, like why I don't do this, when something's coming out of one channel, it will never be as beefy as something with two layers. And I've spoken to Sonic Academy, the people that make this, about making another kick where it's like you have the transient uh, um, frequency operator, whatever this is, um, oscillator, and then another one um, doing the like sub sub. So you'll have like so you'd have like two sub controls. That's what I, I'd want, so I wouldn't have to do it within Serum. And then you could just layer the two things on top of each other. But because it doesn't have that, I just make another channel. Because 
when you want something to pop out in the mix, having more contrast means having something here and then something here. So it's a lot easier to get a lot of contrast when you have two channels and you can do one thing to another one thing and another thing to another. So say I want to like compress this part of the sound. You know, my sub is still intact because I didn't have it on the same channel. So that's uh, how I do kick design. Okay, so the question, I guess I mean, how do you process your subs and do you ever compress your kick sub together? Yeah, sometimes, like rarely. I think that uh, method of doing things is very dated. Like, but I, it's cool because it's dated, but it is very dated. If you want very clean modern mixes, uh, I'd suggest you don't do it. But if you do want that classic sound that, um, for a long time, the, the house sound was literally just putting a compressor on the master and then having a kick drum really loud in the mix. Like if you took the compressor off the master, it would just sound like a big kick drum and then everything else tiny. And then the kick drum would just compress everything else down while the kick drum was playing. That's a very like old school way of doing things. So my thoughts on Noisia ending their project and how it'll affect the bass producer music community. Yeah, I was, I've was i been thinking about that a lot. Yeah, it's gonna be a huge impact because they were like really pushing everything forward. Like they set the bar and it's gonna be interesting to see who sets the bar from now on. In terms of like really precision bass music, with really precise high end, they were like the only ones doing it. So I don't know. I honestly don't know who, how the whole bass music scene is gonna cope and uh, push forward without them. So yeah, I'll, I'll answer maybe one more question then I'm gonna um, call it a day. Why Ableton? Well, why Ableton over like Bitwig and other other and that other doll that's like almost as good? I don't know. I like Ableton. I've been using it for eleven years now, and that's just the doll that um, I fell in love with. I started on Fruity Loops. Actually, I started on Logic Five, then I went to Fruity Loops, and then. Um, I landed on Ableton. I just like the ease of use of Ableton, especially now that you can put groups and groups and groups. You know, there's no advantage of any other DAW over Ableton. The, before, it was annoying that you couldn't like put groups within groups, and therefore, you know, you had to do routing and yeah. So Ableton just is way easier, and also, you know, having Max built in into it. Um, I love using Max for Live, especially for like attaching LFOs and stuff to various um, parameters. It's like, I can't imagine trying to work in like Cubase or Logic and not having these. Being able to just map this to whatever. So that's why I use Ableton. Um, yeah, I think with it, when it comes to other DAWs, it's like there's a lot more automation and, and um, I mean, there's a lot more manual automation that you probably have to do to get the sound that you want. And like, yeah, a lot of more manual labor in other uh, DAWs. And I guess that just suits me that I'm kind of a bit la lazier. Ableton's good for lazy people and so is uh, FL and I love both of those things <laughs> so thanks for tuning in and yeah go subscribe to the Madzu YouTube channel you'll get all sorts of more updates and yeah also uh, follow us on Twitch and that will allow you to see whenever I'm streaming again so thank you so much and I'll see you next time